I flew across Canada on only Dash 8s. It took 10 flights over the course of 5 days and some slight discomfort, traveling from Victoria, British Columbia to St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador. Now, if for some reason you clicked on this video and you're not an aviation enthusiast, let's just say that the Dash 8 is basically the backbone of regional Canadian aviation. If you've ever taken any short connecting flight within Canada, you've probably flown on a Dash 8. That being said, it is very much a regional airliner, and not the most ideal plane for flights longer than an hour or two. In another video I posted back in January, I mentioned it would theoretically be possible to fly across the country on only turboprop airplanes, and you can imagine what happened next. So, as one does, I added the extra challenge of finding a route that would take me across the country on exclusively Dash 8 400s, and that's what you're about to watch. This is, without doubt, the stupidest thing I've ever done, so please enjoy. Starting this adventure off on the west coast in Victoria, there's one stop I wanted to make before the first flight. This unassuming residential street actually marks mile zero of the Trans-Canada Highway, which stretches all the way across the country for 7,821 kilometers ending in St. John's. So it seemed only fitting to come here, walk down to the water, and reflect on this wonderfully stupid and irreverent journey that I was about to take. This is how I die, isn't it? After spending a day around Victoria Airport with my good friend Brandon, who actually came up with that route in the first place, and is very much to blame for what happened next, it was time for the first flight. The first three legs of this trip will be with Air Canada Express, and so I made sure to get some of the good quality boarding passes as mementos for later on. As BC's capital, Victoria has a decent amount of passenger traffic through a very nice terminal building. Most of their flights, though, are short commuter ones to Vancouver, the largest city in the province, and as you might have guessed, that's where I'm headed first. At least I would be after an hour and 15 minute delay due to a technical issue. Walking across the ramp to this trusty Dash 8 400 operated by Jazz Aviation, the reality of what I'd be doing over the next few days really started to set in. What am I doing with my life? I settled in the very back of the plane in seat 20F, and we said goodbye to Victoria. Now, Victoria to Vancouver is ironically one of the shortest Dash 8 routes in the entire country, a 63 kilometer hop across the Strait of Georgia. Oftentimes, you're in the air for barely 10 or 15 minutes. It's one of those routes that's more for connecting travelers than actually getting from place to place, since you can just take a ferry for much, much less. Even then, it's honestly one of my favorite routes to fly just for the scenery over the Gulf Islands, and on a clear day like today, they fly at just 3,000 feet. And with that, flight number one of 10 was in the books. So thank you all for watching and stay tuned for the next nine parts. Nah, could you imagine? This is the only flight for today though, and I'll explain why tomorrow. The second day had me back at Canada's second busiest airport, bright and early, for a couple hours of flying across the mountains. It was also my first time flying out of these ground loading gates at YVR, which are pretty much exclusively Dash 8 flights. Weirdly, it's also home to the only Tim Hortons in the domestic terminal, which predictably has a constant lineup. The first of two flights today would take me from Vancouver to Kamloops on this new livery Dash. For this one, I grabbed a seat further forward in 5A, and lucked out big time with a free seat next to me. Oh, and just to make this entire trip even more fun, I do have longer legs than your average Dash 8 passenger. We taxied out to runway 26 left, and said farewell to the west coast. As we turned eastbound over the Strait of Georgia, I knew I would not be seeing much water during the next couple of days over the prairies. 
Vancouver to Kamloops is only about half an hour of flight time, but it's without a doubt one of the most scenic ones of this entire trip. Over the mountains, we were cruising at only 23,000 feet, and the views below just refused to quit. This flight was also long enough for the first of many Dash 8 snack services, and EC usually gives out complimentary drinks and these Biscoffs on the morning flights. Air Canada Express's Dash 8 400s in general are fairly basic, but one useful thing they all have are these coat hooks. And as you'll soon see, they also have much more padded seats than some other carriers. That's not a huge deal on a shorter flight like this, but for something like Calgary to Yellowknife, it definitely makes a difference. We quickly started our descent, and flight number two came to a close with some gorgeous views on the approach. Kamloops Airport is pretty modest, and they, obviously, don't quite have a process for connections, so I did have to go outside and clear security again. At the very least, it gave me a chance to take a look around a surprisingly treeless part of British Columbia. Back inside in the post-security area, Kamloops Airport is very clearly Dash 8 sized, much like many airports across the country. The third flight would be on board another old livery dash off to Calgary, a natural next stop for me, considering it's home and also a big hub for more Dash 8 flights going east. There are a couple of these airports in the mountains that only have flights to either Vancouver or Calgary since both are major hubs. For the sake of simplicity, I stuck with AC again for the third leg. Flight number three. I grabbed seat 1A at the front, probably my favorite on the Dash 8 400, lucked out again with the empty aisle seat, and said goodbye to Camp Loops. This next flight off to Calgary took just under an hour, passing over many of BC's interior lakes before crossing the eastern slopes of the Rockies. The first row on these planes usually has the tray tables in the armrests, and we got another snack service, but this time with pretzels. Sitting in the front also gives you easy access to the single lavatory on the Dash 8 400, which is, well, quite comical for anyone over 5 feet. Another thing is that most Dash 8 400s here don't actually have a sink. My understanding is that the water lines freeze up easily in the winter, so most Dash 8s just don't have running water. Now, booking 10 flights across the country is one thing, one quite expensive thing, but there's also a lot of planning behind it. The reason I'm only doing a few legs a day is that I had to be extra conservative when it came to planning. In theory, you could make it from Victoria to as far as Saskatchewan or Manitoba in a single day, but it would only take one misconnection to royally mess up the rest of the flights. Even though I did this in July, there was a good chance of a delay or outright cancellation for a thunderstorm, smoke, or some other kind of weather. There's another element too, and it's that summer 2022 was a bit chaotic for airlines, so a cancellation for crew or maintenance reasons was also a distinct possibility. That's why I gave myself lots of buffer for things to go wrong, and for the most part, booked morning flights since those are often the most consistently on time. I also planned my overnights accordingly, and made sure to stay a night right here at home. Under normal circumstances, this would probably be the end of a trip for me, but oh no, it's only started. Tonight's stay thankfully gave me some time to dump some footage, do laundry, and get a good night's sleep in my own bed. Naturally, the next stop on a cross-country journey like this is in Saskatchewan, but as far as I could tell, most Air Canada flights there from Alberta were being flown with CRJs. So it's time to switch over to WestJet for the next few flights, operated by WestJet Encore, and the first of those will be this early morning one off to Edmonton. And yes, I realize I'm making exactly zero progress going east with this, but I had a connection there that I'll talk about shortly. This will be departing from one of Calgary's few ramp boarding gates, in a part of Concourse A that looks very much like a Costco. The last time I flew out of here was in 2019 on a WestJet Link SOP, and I clearly forgot how, shall we say, lowest possible budget it is. Stepping on board the first of several Encore flights coming up, you can already tell that the cabins look much more modern. 
that comes at the expense of, well, general comfort, as you can see. I wedged myself into seat 6A, and, perhaps unsurprisingly, they ended up closing the doors with only 11 passengers. I say unsurprisingly, because I doubt many people have a need to go to Edmonton at 7 in the morning, unless you're doing a stupid connection there like me. I said goodbye to home for another couple of days, and we were off to Alberta's capital. Calgary to Edmonton is a fairly short flight connecting Alberta's two largest cities, covering a distance of only 244 kilometers. This flight, much like this entire video, is a little bit unnecessary since Encore flies Dash 8s from Calgary to Saskatchewan anyway. For some reason though, this was cheaper than the non-stop flight, and it unintentionally makes this whole cross-country thing an even 10 flights. Cups of water were given out, I enjoyed the extra space, and before long, we were on the descent. We ended up parking by the US gates thanks to some apron resurfacing taking place. My next flight was parked at the gates near the tower though, so that made for a fun walk down nearly the entire length of the terminal. Flight number 5 is another encore over to Regina, Saskatchewan, boarding through my favorite gates in Edmonton for these views of the tower. Now, Encore's Dash 8 400 to seat 78 passengers just like every other airline, but they are the only one to have kind of a two-class configuration. I say kind of, because they're ultimately the exact same seats, just these 10 up at the front. And in order to sit in the exit row for extra space, you have to pay for a premium fare, which is usually double the price. However, they do have upgrades available at check-in for a far more sensible amount, and I grabbed seat 2D. These small water bottles were handed out for premium, and we were soon on our way across the prairies. The service started very quickly after takeoff, and I got myself a drink, as well as this whole snack box. Apparently that's something that Premium gets on Encore now, which was very surprising. Normally you get just the same cookie or pretzels as everyone else, but inside this were actual goodies. That really impressed me, and the rest of the flight went by in no time at all. The next leg eastbound, unfortunately, isn't a daily flight, so despite arriving here in the morning, the lack of any Dash 8 flights to the east today means another overnight. That meant I had to figure out, what does one do with 24 hours in Regina? Oh, okay. Jokes aside, obviously I went plane spotting for a couple hours, got a ride into town, and went for a nice walk around the Saskatchewan Legislative Building. This sits right on the edge of Wascana Lake in central Regina, and is very pretty. I walked around for a bit, narrowly avoided death a couple times, and after that early morning start, made my way to a hotel for some much needed sleep. After yesterday's time on Encore, it's time for yet a couple more Encore flights. An Encore Encore, if you will. The first flight of the day is this one off to Winnipeg, as seen through these windows, which Regina Airport undoubtedly gets a D grade for. Convinced by my surprisingly decent experience in Encore Premium, they suckered me into giving them more money. Turns out I'd be surprised again by the cabin, since this is one of two Dash 8s that Encore scooped up from now bankrupt Hawaiian airline Island Air in 2018. I settled very comfortably into seat 3A, again with a free aisle, got another bottle of water, and we were off to Manitoba. This flight to Winnipeg makes up another 533 kilometers, and is pretty much just a straight shot eastbound over the last bit of the prairies. These Island Air seats are, as you would expect, much more comfortable than the normal Encore ones, and have tons of storage. Another drink and snack service went by quickly, with another one of these snack boxes given out to premium. These snack box contents, currently trying to vibrate themselves off the tray table, were the exact same ones as yesterday, just with almonds instead. Also, another unexpected perk of Encore Premium is that the items on these new menus are actually free. 
The crew asked if I wanted anything off the menu on yesterday's flight as well, but it wasn't until today's that I realized these were all free for premium. It's safe to say that Encores definitely stepped up their game, but how long that'll last for is anyone's guess. With that, flight number 6 was done, and now I can finally say that we're at the geographic halfway point. Now the next flight was an important one for the all Dash 8 nature of this trip, since as far as I could tell, it's the only one connecting Western and Eastern Canada. There are other direct flights in between of course, but as far as Dash 8 specific ones go, it was the most obvious choice. This one is actually a bit of a milk run, and starts off in Edmonton, goes to Regina, Winnipeg, and then finally to Thunder Bay. That meant we got right back on the same plane, I confirmed that economy legroom is still not great, and less than an hour after landing here, it was off to Ontario. Winnipeg to Thunder Bay crosses into the Canadian Shield, leaving the prairies behind as we headed towards the western shore of Lake Superior. On board we got the usual complimentary drink, and these cookies too. Since this flight was with the same plane, WestJet said that the connection time in between flights was just 31 minutes, which seemed ambitious. We ended up departing a little over half an hour late, and although Thunder Bay is where I'm staying tonight, I had a very important stop to make before it got too late. After landing in Thunder Bay, I quickly rushed out of the terminal and into a taxi for a very specific reason, that Air Canada DC-9 just across the airport. This 1968-built DC-930 was donated to Confederation College back in 2003 for educational purposes. I had heard through a few people that it was going to be scrapped relatively soon, so once I realized Thunder Bay was going to be a stop, I knew I had to go see it. And I'm so glad I did, because just a few months later, at the end of September, it was gone. So, a huge thank you to the folks at the college for letting me take up some time at the end of their day. It may have been 30 minutes or so of poking around this relatively obscure piece of aviation history, but it's not something I'm going to forget anytime soon. Besides, I kind of own a piece of it now, so a bit hard to. With that, day number 4 came to a close, and it was time for bed, because, ironically, I'd be doing the most traveling of this entire thing on the very last day. With a trip like this, it was kind of inevitable that I'd be forced to stop in the center of the universe at some point, either there or Montreal. Air Canada Express and WestJet Encore both fly from Thunder Bay to Toronto Pearson, but A, I think I've had enough of Jazz and Encore dashes at this point, and B, Pearson is, well, Pearson. So the other option, and arguably one of the nicest in the country, is Porter, an all Dash 8 400 airline that's based out of Billy Bishop Airport in downtown Toronto. I first flew them in February, and they were very impressive, so for this final day of flying, I was planning to stick with them for the last three flights. Before that though, I got to take a look around Porter's hangar here in Thunder Bay, and I even got to walk through the plane that would be taking me on flight number 8. Porter is a bit like a Canadian JetBlue if you will, with a more refined onboard service, so you can imagine I was looking forward to these next couple of flights, and to being done with this ridiculous self-imposed challenge. I made my way to seat 5D, and right as the sun rose, it was off to Toronto. The first flight of three today is a pretty long one, crossing over Lake Superior and Huron and adding another 900 kilometers to the total. I fell asleep right after we took off, and after about an hour in the air, the crew started the snack service. I went for a cup of coffee and Porter's classic shortbread cookie, which was delicious. There's a bit more to their service though, since they even have actual glasses for drinks, which I'll try out on the next flight. Porter is also one of the few airlines I've seen bring back in-flight magazines. I'm very much looking forward to seeing them get their new E2s. In the meantime, it was a treat to watch the scenery go by over the Great Lakes on such a beautifully clear morning. Plus, we even got a runway 26 arrival into Billy Bishop Airport, which, well, you'll see. Billy 
Bishop Toronto City Airport is one of the most interesting airports in Canada by far. Not only does it have a super short runway, but the downtown location is not something you're going to find anywhere else in the country. So, four days later, I finally found myself here in Canada's largest city, and so far, things were going pretty smoothly. A bit too smoothly. Flight number 9 would take me to Halifax, Nova Scotia, where I'd connect onwards to St. John's for the 10th and final Dash flight. However, our boarding time came and went without a single word from anyone at Porter. Another half an hour passed without any explanation before we actually made our way on board. I settled into seat 8A, and we were... well, not going anywhere fast. Aircraft to uh, get all the aircraft bags on. Uh, they were just running a little bit behind. I sincerely apologize uh, for further delay here, but hopefully they'll have those uh, boarded up in the next uh, hopefully few minutes, and then we will have it underway. It's certainly taking longer than uh, what uh, any of us were hoping for, uh, expected, so uh, just gotta bear with us for a few minutes until everything gets on, on board and then we will be closing up. We eventually left the gate well over an hour behind schedule, which put my connection in Halifax in a bit of peril. Still, Toronto City takeoffs are always fun. to Halifax is by far the longest flight of this trip, at over 1,200 kilometers and two solid hours of flight time. And yet, it's still not the longest Dash 8 flight that Porter's ever done. In years past, they've done flights to Melbourne, Florida with their Dash 8s, pushing three hours in the air. We eventually got the full Porter onboard service, which included complimentary snacks and finally a drink in a Porter glass. That's such a cool detail that really sets Porter apart from everyone else. Now, either flying 9-8s in a row was starting to take its toll, or it was just this particular seat. But this flight felt like two hours of a massage chair that you can't turn off. I think I just happened to pick the most unideal seat for the longest flight of them all. Still, I'd never been to Atlantic Canada before, which was also part of the reason I convinced myself to do this, so I was genuinely looking forward to spending a couple days here. In the meantime though, I was pretty nervous about that connection, and the next few minutes could decide whether or not there'd be a day six of this. Unfortunately, as I suspected, the next flight to St. John's left just as we were taxiing in. That meant a bit of a wait to figure things out, since there were at least seven other people doing the same connection. To Porter's credit, they were very helpful, giving out trip interruption information as well as this $15 meal voucher. They also rebooked me on the next Porter flight for no extra charge. The only problem is, the next Porter flight to St. John's didn't leave for almost six hours, and would get me there around midnight. Now, I don't know about you, but I didn't spend five days straight on Dash 8s just to end this by going straight to a hotel. Besides, I had one more stop I wanted to make once I got there, and daylight was kind of important for that too. So, with many thanks to a friend at Air Canada, and apologies to Porter, I ended up grabbing a last minute seat that would get me to St. John's at around 7pm instead. With that, here is the very last Dash 8 of this trip across Canada. I made my way to the back to seat 16A, and with some typical Atlantic Canada weather, it was finally off to Newfoundland. The final flight was mostly over water, capping off this 5,000 plus kilometer journey with another 883 covered. Interestingly, the island of Newfoundland and a bit of Labrador have their own time zone set aside from the rest of the country at a half hour offset from Atlantic time. That means I've passed through six time zones since leaving British Columbia, with a four and a half hour difference from Victoria. My reward for doing so? One last helping of jazz pretzels and a drink. The weather thankfully cleared up as we approached St. John's, with some gorgeous views below, and finally, the end was in sight.
five days, 10 flights, and over 5,000 kilometers later, I successfully flew across Canada on only Dash 8s. It may have been unconventional, but it was a good way to see this amazing country of ours, and honestly, makes me appreciate the Dash 8 even more. No matter where you go in Canada, at one point or another, there will have been a Canadian life affected by the Dash 8, the best-selling turboprop airliner ever made in this country. The day after I got here, I stopped by the other Mile Zero monument outside of St. John's City Hall, and had a moment of reflection. In addition to the 10 flights, 11 cities and their respective airports were also a part of this journey. Victoria, Vancouver, Kamloops, Calgary, Edmonton, Regina, Winnipeg, Thunder Bay, Toronto, Halifax, and now St. John's. Something about seeing the entire journey visualized like this had me feeling accomplished, and strangely, almost a bit sad that it was over. Like I said before though, I had one more stop after that last flight. This is Cape Spear, Canada's easternmost point. From here, there's nothing but the vast expanse of the North Atlantic Ocean in one direction, and the rest of the country in the other. To put it into perspective, right now I'm closer to Europe than I am to Victoria, or even Calgary. It's a poignant reminder of just how important aviation is in this huge country of ours, and I can't think of a better place to wrap up this... Yeah, I still can't put a positive spin on it, but you know what? It was fun. That said, I do have one thing to show for it. I mentioned early on that I made sure to get some good quality boarding passes, and I continue to do that at every new starting point. I now have 10 boarding passes, one from each of these Dash 8 flights that took me all the way from Victoria to St. John's to the easternmost point of Canada. It's been quite the journey, and I hope you enjoyed this aviation adventure from coast to coast. Genuinely, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you around.